Jimmy Iovine, you are not only uh, uh, the head of Interscope Records, and uh, you also are the subject. I was the head of Interscope. Oh, there was the head. I apologize for that. Uh, you also are the one of the main subjects of the uh, documentary The Defiant Ones, which which was on HBO with Dr. Dre. Um, how did you come into contact with Alan Hughes, the man who directed this? Well, what happened there was I, Alan, early days of Interscope, Alan uh, directed a few Tupac videos. So that's when I met Alan. And um, then I, I did a deal with him uh, for a label or something. And... Couple of things over the years, and we've always—I've always known him. So you know, I, he's just, I just—I just known him from around, you know. And and what was his uh, pitch to you like about this, uh, about well, to make this documentary? HBO, we were going to do a, a documentary on Interscope. Of course, the Radioscope was a very unique situation, very very volatile. I don't think any entertainment company ever has been through something like that. And um, so, but then I changed my mind because I didn't want to. I didn't want, I just didn't feel, I, I didn't feel like I wanted to tell those stories again. I didn't, want to, I, don't, I didn't want to unearth them, rather. You know, I didn't want to bring them up, you know? And so I said, let's just, let's not do that. So a year later, Alan called me up and he said, uh, no, that's not the story. The story is a white and a black guy from, from racially charged neighborhoods get together and have to, through music and have to stay together through some of the difficulties that they actually had growing up, you know? And um, that sounded positive to me because there aren't a lot of uh, companies where an African-American man and all women and vice versa, where white and black work together like that as partners and go, and the two cultures bring so much to each other. They really do. And I, I wanted to show that. And I wanted to show the loyalty and the commitment and I wanted to show what that bond can do and how, how those two different cultures could just mesh into something really, really great. And that definitely comes across in the documentary. It's really fascinating how, uh, you know, the, the, how your two paths intersect. Um, one of the interesting things that Alan told us uh, when we interviewed him was about uh, how right at the start of production, uh, everything almost went to hell in a handbasket because of the uh, the infamous video with uh, Dr. Dre and <laughs> Tyrese um, uh, uh, leaking the details of the Apple deal. Uh, I was wondering if you could describe what it was like on your end when the video with Dre and Tyrone came out and yeah, how that affected your participation you in the in the project. You mean Tyrese? You uh, mean which did I, what did I say? His name is Tyrese. Oh, what did I say? Tyrone. Oh my God, I've been listening to too much Erica Badu. I'm sorry. <laughs> what well, doesn't matter what his name was at that point. What happened was, you know, Puff called me up at, um, the, the deal had leaked. And we were, supposed, we were supposed to shut down and not talk to anybody. So um, Puff called me up and said, hey man, I thought, how come you didn't tell me about this deal? I said, uh, I can't talk about anything. That was about nine o'clock. Two in the morning, he called me up and uh, got me up and he said, I thought you said you weren't doing anything. Dre and Tyrese are on Facebook. And then I said, oh shit. And that, that, was, a, that was a bad day, bad night, bad everything. So, uh, you know, yeah, the deal, but I also canceled the documentary a couple of times before that because I don't know, I just, I just, you know, there's a lot of sensitive stuff in there, you know, and um, I wasn't sure. But uh, as we were going, Alan, you know, was very honest about it. And Dre and I didn't want like, then they did this, then they did that. We didn't want a parade. You know what I mean? We weren't interested in a parade. That's what was great about Alan, because he wasn't interested in making one, you know. Oh, they did this, then they did that, then they did this, then they did that. Who gives a shit, you know? And, and uh, so... I kind of like Alan nailed it, and he had these great editors with him. It, it, yeah, he really did. And I think probably, you know, there's so much that goes on in that, but I think probably the most surreal thing in that is the whole thing that went down with, you know, East Coast uh, rap versus West Coast rap, uh, you know, uh, uh, bubbling up at the Source Awards, and then, of course, the uh, tragic murders of 
uh, Tupac and Biggie. Um, I was wondering if at what point did it seem to you that this was getting out of control? Was it the actual murders themselves or was it something else before that? It was it would just kept building and I kept trying to keep keep it together because I knew we had something great musically. So and while we're doing that, then Eminem, then Marshall Mathers, I'm not no not before Eminem, when we're doing that. Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson take off, and they were also very, very controversial, you know, and and somewhat troubling. And um, so it was a lot going on, and you know, and unfortunately, um, two of the greatest stars ever were killed, and a great art, greatest artist rather, and um, you know, that's crazy. And a, a, a lot of other things happened that were just. Uh, it just got out of hand. And uh, another thing that I thought was really interesting in the documentary, and I wish they had uh, stayed on it a bit more, was um, your, uh, the the consequences of uh, digital music, and especially, of course, when Napster, um, you know, rock, rocked everything with its uh, with its program. Um, when did you uh, when did you first sense that there was this seismic shift that was coming in the music industry? The minute I saw Napster, within four <laughs> seconds, I I called up my buddy Doug Morris and I said, "We're screwed. This is over. Toast." And and uh, I was and it, it was I remember it very very vividly because I was coming up with my musical tastes at that time, and I I was wondering. Uh, you know, it seems like the music industry has kind of integrated itself pretty well, at least at this point. Um, I don't but, think so. I oh, don't you don't think so? Why not? No, 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 no. Because what's happening now is young artists are promoting themselves, which is great because they have all that. They have YouTube, they have Spotify, they have Apple Music, they have Facebook, they have, I mean, Instagram, they have you know, uh, uh, Snapchat, they have Twitter. So they have, now the deals that they're getting are so incredible, which is great for the artist, but it's not great for the labels. And oh, okay. so that's a real problem for the labels because sooner or later, that squeeze is gonna come. And, um, and it's mostly uh, streaming, a lot of it is current music, you know, uh, what's happening so far, you know, most of it, of course, Young people play music more than older people. Not not saying they don't that they 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 don't play better music a lot, but they just have more time. Look, young kids mm -hmm. have more time, and they're more integrated with the technology. I love Bob Dylan, but I can't play him as much as my stepdaughter Skyla can play uh, Cardi B. <laughs> you know, what I mean? <laughs> just more time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I, I think that's why I kind of stayed away from some of the streaming services because I'm more into classic rock you know like you know peter gabriel steely dan and they're not as readily available peter gabriel only just became available on spotify well i mean it's all it's all coming together the music's all there it's just that the labels are still not integrated they still don't have a plan as far as i'm concerned they're waiting for technology to boom and that's that boom could end up um blowing up in the wrong direction uh, I was actually I was going to ask you what you thought the biggest mistake the music industry made in reaction to Napster and digital music is that do you still consider their their the uh, what the the process that they've taken to be the biggest mistake or has everything, it been something else? Everything, every 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 step of the way, as far as I'm concerned, has been a mistake. I mean, um, you know, the Napster thing, of course, suing them was a mistake. Um, then. You know, not fighting YouTube hard enough, no offense. Hmm. You know, because, uh, and then even something silly like the billboard charts, up until this year, of course, we stepped in and got the labels to support. And, um, but the, uh, the billboard chart, if you had a stream on YouTube, it counted the same as a stream on Spotify paid. So artists are going like, Okay, I got to promote my music everywhere. So they're promoting all the free music, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I, I, I just, I just don't. I really don't feel that um, the labels have got it quite yet. 
I, I don't think this, the, the streaming services have it either because they're all the same. You know what I mean? And, and um, that means price will drive that. Whoever causes the cheapest, whoever charges the cheapest will get the most people. Mm -hmm. There's no differentiation. You can't have Netflix there with $6 billion in original content and then all of a sudden have Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music and Google Music with peanuts, with nothing. So they, these things got to differentiate themselves. They haven't yet. So both the labels and the streaming services have got to come further in their game. Do you think that? Do you think that that they'll ever actually catch up with it properly? Because it seems like technology sometimes is just moving so fast, and the advances in it are yeah, just coming so quickly. To catch up, you just gotta, you just gotta be alert and pivot. You know what I mean? I mean, if I if I knew what was going to happen, I'd go to the racetrack. I wouldn't be talking to you. You know what I mean? I go <laughs> there a couple of bucks, and and I would do great at the track. But I have no idea. But uh, but that billboard chart thing, you know, the labels finally got behind it, and they changed the chart now. So they got to, that's a little thing, but they, they're big, big, big things, you know. Uh, that I just uh, I just don't think I think they're riding this thing, and I don't I think they should get out in front of it. That's my opinion. Uh, so to sort of uh, I'm sorry I got it's something I've always just found fascinating. Um, uh, uh, to get back more into the actual music part of this, um, you've always had such a great year. And, and one of the fascinating things I loved about the documentary was how I, I came to really appreciate, you know, what, you know, a producer does and what an engineer does and what mixers do. Right. Um, and, and especially seeing, you know, like Dr. Dre at that soundboard uh, yeah. in the first episode is so, it is so it, it, uh, riveting. Uh, I'm wondering what is, um, you personally, what's the most well put together album you've ever heard that you did not have a part in, in making? Well, naturally, it's Sgt. Pepper. That's one. Because for many reasons, considering they did it with two four tracks linked mm -hmm. together and, the, and how primitive the equipment was, they were, they were inventing things that equipment wasn't built for yet. That didn't, the technology didn't exist. They just created it with spit and scotch tape of what they had. So I'd have to say that is absolutely. Um, um, I would say um, Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Um, I would say uh, Pink Floyd, The Wall. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, I really feel it, feel this way. Uh, some hip hop album, like I, the chronic is an incredible album by Dre, you know, um, yeah, that's and, one of my stepdad's favorites. Well, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, it's really a conceived album, you know? So mm -hmm. I have a lot of albums that I really loved over the years, but those are some of my, ones that I think are constructed. The question I think you asked, I think I answered with those sort of albums. You know? Yeah, they're, they're, they're well put together. Um, and, and, and it's made a <laughs> Yeah, and, and one of the reasons I asked is like, I remember when the whole uh, Napster thing broke, uh, th there were all these articles that came out about what's gonna happen to the art of the album. And I'm just glad, I think it has survived. Um, uh, it's it's a bit different, but I still think that the, the yeah, artist still yeah. again again you're 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 making you're making assumptions on things that are like the labels have got uh, have merged with the, the platform. Neither one of them have got it right yet. Nothing wrong. They'll get it right eventually, hopefully. But the album don't think in terms of the album has to survive. Think in terms of uh, musicians need to come up with something new of what their expression is it doesn't have to be 12 songs in a row you know with liner notes it could be something else so it doesn't have to survive mm -hmm. you know the saying that i learned a long time ago and i always try to apply it is that when i wake up you know i try to say to myself okay everything that you know could already be wrong and if you start your day out like that you're going to be curious and you're going to listen to people 
So I'm not, I don't care if the album survives or didn't survive. I care about new things that are exciting. And if I was a musical artist, I would say, how do I do something that no one's ever done before? That's what I would try to do. And if, I, if I'm not a musical artist, and, I'm, and uh, but, but I also always try to do things that have never been done before. So I try to do it in a school. I try, I try to do it beats. That's what I try to do with Apple Music. I mean, we're trying to, and by the way, we're not there. Neither is Spotify, neither is Amazon in streaming. Streaming services need to come the next distance to for the artist and for the consumer. And I, I and I love that that attitude that that you know the, to make yourself open to new interpretations of things. I think that's a really that's that's a, I mean everything else bores me. You know what I mean? I oh yeah. Like for me, you know that, that's just the way I am. I I I, I mean I you know I've done album. I worked in mediums for a long time and I repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. But but when somebody's got something new, I, I I'm I'm trying to be first in line to get to to see what's up. So uh, one of the uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, and I know this, uh, you may not have an, an answer to this. You said that you were uh, not a big fan of opening up with the docu uh, at, at first with the idea of a documentary, but um, uh, it seems like there are so many stories. Um, and of course you can't fit them all into uh, the program. Is there one that you particularly like that didn't make it in there? First of all, I don't know how Alan Hughes did what he did. And every time I run into, I did something in front of a bunch of directors uh, the other day, and they were also commenting on that. I'm not quite sure how he blended all this with the editing and the music and the idea. I, I, I just know it's good, but I don't really know how he did it, you know? And um, so, I mean, from, I love Dre's bit with the purple suit on, you know what I mean? Or whatever that was yeah. when he for the first time. I'm so glad. I would love to, I'd love to buy that guy a drink, whoever filmed him, you know what I mean? That was because we have that. You know, I love, um, Nacho, I love all the Dre bits. <laughs> <laughs> the, in that first episode, especially the guy who owned the club that Dre pr first performed at. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, that, those were priceless bits. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, you, you come from nothing, and things happen like that. It's a miracle, you know. That's why Dre and I—we come from a very, you know, we didn't have anything, you know. And um, to be able to, for myself personally, to be able to go through, you know, 1975, 1973 to 1978 with Bruce Springsteen, John Lennon, and Patti Smith—that was my college education. I. Um, I didn't have any education. I, I mean, a high school, you know, but I hated high school. <laughs> <laughs> I, still I think hate, you found something that eventually worked for you. I still hate high school. 